think we're probably good, Janessa, if you want to get Great. started. Yeah. It's so lovely to see everyone here. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining. Absolutely. We're excited to get, get started. Um, welcome to the Demonic Care Client webinars. Um, the purpose of these webinars is mostly to learn from fellow funeral professionals like yourselves um, so we can navigate the challenges and also the opportunities that arise in our industry. Um, obviously, we invite you to join in with all of your questions, comments, concerns, whatever you have during this webinar. But if again, I think that everyone's muted. So if you guys could mute yourself for now. Um, and then when you have a comment, other than the panelists, if you have a comment, then you can enter it into the chat or mute, unmute yourselves once I open it up to questions. So there's gonna be a couple of times when I open it up to discussion, feel free to unmute yourself then and answer or ask any of your questions. You can also, again, ask it in the chat and the account managers will, will watch that for me. Um, we have our wonderful, wonderful panelists for this webinar. We have Deborah Ali and Saeed Ali, um, and they're from All People's Funeral Home in Texas. If you wanna wave, they're right there. <laughs> they're wonderful. Um, we also have Todd Snyder from Snyder Funeral Home in Ohio. Um, if you want to wave, Todd. And then we also have Lindsay John Johnka from Reynolds Johnka Funeral Home. Um, welcome, panelists. We're so excited to have you guys. Um, there's a reason that we invited you guys to be on this panel. We, we feel like each one of them has a unique perspective to bring and a lot of really interesting insights. So we're going to hop right into it. Um, we're going to just go one by one and have you guys introduce yourselves. Um, if you could tell us how long you've been in the funeral profession for, um, and also tell us what you love about the funeral profession and what you find is challenging about the funeral profession. So Deborah and Saeed, if you want to start us off, that would be great. Deborah Ali, and I've been in the funeral industry for uh, since 1993. Um, and coaching on what to do next. <laughs> I love it. Um, what was the other question? What, um, was what do you love about the funeral industry and what do you find challenging about the funeral industry? Um, what I love about uh, the funeral industry is that it's very diversified. Um, we do um, all different uh, walks of nationalities. So I'm constantly meeting people on a daily basis. And um, probably what's challenging is to um have to funeralize family members and uh, friends that we've you know met along the way yeah definitely and Saeed what about you how long have you been with the funeral industry I've been in the funeral industry uh working full-time since 2016 um and I love uh that this is in a sense of ministry um what we do is it could be healing. Uh, we're important, and um, we're in an important step in the process for families who are grieving. Um, maybe they might not recognize that at the moment, but at some point they'll look back and appreciate. Be helpful in the healing process. Um, what I find challenging is the different range of emotions, dealing with that as well as dealing with staff members with different personalities and it, it's all good, <laughs> but it is, it can be challenging. So you just have to be strategic in the way you maneuver. Definitely, definitely. That was a great answer. Thank you. Um, Todd Snyder, if you could, if you could unmute yourself and tell us how long you've been in the funeral profession, what you love about it and what is, what you find challenging. Sure. Yeah, I'm Todd Snyder. I'm a third generation director. Um, I started when I was seven years old, carrying folding chairs and moving flowers. Um, so I've been doing this 52 years. There's an insight to my age. Uh, at 21, my parents put me in charge managing a funeral home. And I look back and I think, yikes, what were those families experience at that point? Uh, what I really like about this uh, profession is that it is so multifaceted. Um, from hour to hour, my role changes from accountant to HR director to psychiatrist. Um, I got to be careful here. Um, psychologist to sociologist to sometimes even caterer. So uh, what we do is so multifaceted that it's really not boring. 
Um, and that can, that can be sometimes its own challenge, but one of the beauties is in three to seven, increasingly now 10 or 14 days, those, those families are gonna be gone and you start all over, sometimes juggling two and three families at a time. Now, the biggest challenge right now is of course, uh, for me, it, it is staffing and getting all of our locations covered and, and getting the right people on the bus and on the right seat in the bus um, and the 24-7, 365 nature of operations. Um, the business side, that's, you know, that's not a challenge anymore. It's the actual operations is the biggest challenge now. Definitely. That makes sense. Um, well, Lindsay, we, we're very grateful. Lindsay is joining us. One of our panelists um, had to do a funeral last minute and clients always come first. So we were happy to have him cover that. And we were really grateful for Lindsay to, for hopping in to this spot and, and covering for him. Um, so Lindsay, go ahead. If, if you could introduce yourself, tell us how long you've been in the profession, what you find challenging and what you love about it. Thank you. Yes, I am Lindsay and I'm a sixth generation director and uh, in the process of becoming an owner of our funeral home and our operation and love helping celebrate life as, as cliche as it sounds, but I uh, helped lay a 95 year old veteran to rest today and just the hugs that we got at the cemetery. That's, that's why I do what I do. And the challenging part is when families don't want to do anything and don't find value in what I do. And it's kind of a, a slap in the face, if you will, that they say, I don't want to be here. I don't want to do this. I don't know why you do this. And it's like, well, because a person lived and their life deserves to be honored and celebrated. So that's, that's my challenge is not necessarily persuading people to do what I want them to do, but just seeing the value of the funeral and of the industry and of the profession and why it's existed for so long. Definitely. And I, I hear you, uh, Todd, I started at about five or six planting flowers in our garden. So I, I, uh, I sympathize with the, the long-term commitment to, to the industry. <laughs> Definitely. And going along with that, Lindsay, if you want to just, the next question is, in a fast-changing wor world, have you noticed differences in the need for ritual and ceremony? If so, how have you adapted to these changes? We've seen, obviously, a big shift from um, traditional burials to cremation in the, even in the last 10 years. Um, but even other rituals and ceremonies that people typically associate with funerals, how have you adapted to people changing their minds and their ideas on that? Yeah, great question. We've definitely seen a shift away from day prior. I, I don't think I've ever done in my career a, a two-day visitation. I mean, that, that just doesn't exist anymore. And so many of our services are all in the same day. So we, we get one shot to do it right. And we've, we've learned to add more staff to that day to make sure everything goes as possible or as perfect as it possibly can. Um, so that's been a definite shift yeah. for us of Rather than having you know multiple events to work for, you, you get one, and sometimes it's a half hour visitation, and then the half hour service, and then sometimes the biggest focus is the luncheon, <laughs> and that's that's what we've learned to focus on as well. Just whatever the family finds value in, we try and make that the biggest part of the service. That's a great answer, um, Todd and Saeed and and Deborah. Anything to add to that question? Just how the funeral, how you've adapted the changes in in the funeral industry in the last couple of years. Well, uh, with COVID, we definitely had to change the way that we do certain things. Not so much now, um, but initially there were only 10 individuals allowed in and then we transferred them out to allow 10 more at a time. Everyone was required to have masks and get temperature checks. It's just, uh, it was a new normal. It still uh, has not gotten back to where it was before, um, but there have been so many adjustments that we've had to make. We just opened a drive-through visitation at our Rocheron location to kind of accommodate families. Um, be, uh, not so much now, but when this first began, there was a need uh, for a mass amount of families to be able to view their loved ones without having to come into the funeral home. So it's, it's really worked. Uh, we're just staying abreast to the changes in the industry and we're going to adjust what we need to in those appropriate times so that we yeah. can serve families the way they need to be or should be. Yeah, that's perfect. Todd, anything to add to that? Yeah, the, the um, 
increase in percentage of disposition by cremation caught so many directors um, kind of off guard or ill-prepared, I think is a better term, because they um, it, it didn't fit into their routines and to their uh, business plans, those that even had business plans. So they didn't understand what those families really were looking for. Uh, they thought that the client just wanted cheap, and that's not necessarily what they wanted. They wanted something different. They didn't want they wanted something other than the Buick that dad drove. And uh, initially, when cremation increased, it was um, misinterpreted by um, guys like guys like me, guys like us. So because it was misinterpreted, it was driven down. And we didn't do a good job of educating uh, our consumers on what they can do and what they can have. And um, I've seen that, that that has been very cyclic in that cremation initially started as disposition only um, without ceremony. Yeah. So now we're seeing, um, we've, we've educated our directors to capture revenue and to drive home the importance of ceremony and value. So we're capturing much more ceremony, even if it's memorial, if it's not uh, full traditional cremation services, using a ceremonial casket. Um, plus we're pricing it better too than we were yeah. even 10, 20 years ago. So um, the cremation families of today are not necessarily all um, budget minded. They just want something different. So yeah. that's, that's been the biggest change of the last few years. There is still the budget consumer and and uh, they're still going to, to find the, the cheapest thing they can on the internet. And we're always gonna have that consumer. But mm -hmm. that's not all of that cremation consumer. Yeah. And they really wanna be marketed. You know? Yeah, so yeah. Um, directors need to be able to um, fulfill and then they'll spend money. That's, that's not an issue. They just, um, they don't know what they don't know. That's a really interesting perspective because I know there, I mean, there is a huge deficit between a traditional burial versus a, a simple cremation, right? There, I, obviously there's a big deficit in, in huge funding. Huge difference in revenue share yeah. there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm coming up with more tradition, not more traditional, but more ceremonial things to add to a cremation is, is a great insight into that. Well, different revenue streams are critical yeah. Uh, to replace the product sales at funeral homes. And um, some, some directors, uh, some of the old, old geezers my age, they just aren't prepared for that. And they're, yeah. not, they're not thriving at it. So you've got to be able to prepare to replace those revenue streams. Definitely. And in the coming years, who knows Hello. how that's going to shift. Hello. Right? You know, things may shift. Yeah. Um, if we could remember Ooh, to keep our-, our uh, I like that. Just make sure to make sure to mute yourselves while you're um, not talking. Um, Eric Newhouse is the one who I hear right now. Sorry, Eric. <laughs> um, we're going to switch over. We're going to focus on all peoples right now. So Saeed and Deborah, we're just going to ask you a couple of questions that are specific to yourselves. Um, I've I've been on social media for a bit. Obviously, I I love social media. I actually saw Saeed's videos on TikTok and on um, Instagram. I think he was on Instagram as well a while ago. And he's actually had a huge amount of success with social media. He's been viral on TikTok multiple times. Um, Saeed, could you speak a little bit more to this and talk about how you've implemented social media to help grow your business, how that's translated from just views on the internet, clicks on the internet to actual business? Absolutely. So um, as I said, I came to All Peoples in 2016 and uh, All Peoples was already doing social media. So I just wanted to make sure that I could bring something effective and build on what was already in place. And so I just immediately took over uh, the social media pages, uh, Facebook and Instagram and started working them and just tried to see what worked and what didn't. But immediately people uh, were just engaging with us um, from the pictures. And so we were on all of the social media platforms, but TikTok. So I started the TikTok in 2020 with plans to do something with it. I just didn't know what. 
Um, until 2021, we recorded the uh, commercial that we did for the drive-through visitation. And I just said, okay, well, now we have a high quality HD video. Let me just see what it does on TikTok. So when I put it on there, um, the TikTok had three followers. And when I woke up the next morning, it was at 60. And then as the day progressed, we made 3,000 before the day ended. And before the week ended, we had 10,000 followers. So that was that was mind boggling to us because um, I don't know why. I know we're, we know that we're good at what we do. And we put the extra touch into it to make sure that we're just exceeding expectations but that exceeded our expectations about what could happen on social media. So now it has translated into a lot more business. I think when I first started all people's, I believe it was about how many cases a year, 75, <laughs> Maybe. 75 a year. And now we're 300 plus a year. Um, and social media has helped that profoundly. And even if not business, people are sending gifts, which we have to tell them don't send because it's just a, a, a our experience also be I guess it's pros and cons to everything. Yeah. So there are some people who are just so in love with what we're doing. They create fake pages and um, Mrs. Williams. They I don't want to say the word, uh, but <laughs> stalk in a sense. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not everybody. It's just uh, I guess it just comes along with the territory. So yeah. numbers have increased the uh, interest in the community. People just walk in the door to say, hey, you and you, um, you know, just want to record videos with us. And yeah. that advances us in a way we couldn't do for ourselves. Now, word of mouth is one thing, but in the day and age of social media and TikTok, it just sets us at another level. Yeah. How do you think that that has translated to your relationship with your community? So with the families that you were already serving, do you think that that's improved the relationship, improved your aftercare service, that sort of thing? Absolutely. Yes. Um, it just, like I said, a lot of the people in the community, I think initially they hear funeral home or pass by funeral home and they're spooked. But uh, when people stop in from seeing us on TikTok, they're just blown away about how um, upbeat we are and how the facilities look. Uh, yeah. I can yeah. go on and on. I'm just trying to think of so many things, but we've been in uh, magazines because of the TikTok and, and what it's been doing. It's just... Yeah, it's, it's a little overwhelming for me because I'm not uh, social media driven. I am uh, on the quiet side and he's more of the active one. And so when we, we're recording a TikTok, we're having to do probably 20 of them for me to get right yeah. what I'm supposed to say. So and when we start, I'm thinking, okay, now I just said that. Now what do I say again? So <laughs> it, it's forever not ending with me. I'm just always saying, oh my God, this is too much. Can we skip a day without doing TikTok? But TikTok, when families come in, they say, oh, we chose you because sure. we saw Because of TikTok. TikTok. Yes. So, so we're getting a lot of that. So that. It on is, even Google is. reviews, yeah, the Google reviews. They so. go and leave reviews and say, "We saw this spinner home on TikTok." Uh, it's just been invaluable. Yeah, That's but and cool. social media also includes like our website because when I first started, I had to. Uh, Bizopia, this company, did a um, uh, some kind of what do you? I don't know the word. Um, they ran statistics on our website and told us that things uh, were not up to par and our SEO was not good so that helped us once we got that together we were able to place higher on google so it just started from the website to the social media accounts and it's just well-rounded now on every front yeah and that's what i wanted that is amazing and lindsay was just asking which city and state are you in we're in rochere in texas which is about 20 miles outside of houston 20 miles outside of houston that is great we also have but we also have a location in uh houston as well but that yeah, one, so we kind of minimized um, how many clients we take there because the chapel is much smaller there. And because we're still in a, somewhat of a pandemic, we don't want that chapel to get overwhelmed with you know, clients. So they drive from that location to this one since this one is the largest. Got it. That makes sense. Um, so I, I believe that with the TikTok, it's 
I think it destigmatizes the funeral industry at large. It gets people, the younger generation, people who typically wouldn't go into a funeral home for the next try. years, right? Um, and getting them, showing them that this is an industry that is young, that is that helps people, genuinely helps people, and that everyone's going to have to deal with it one point or another, you know? And Absolutely. kind of taking away that fear and the unknown of the funeral home is is amazing. So that's, a, that's yes. an amazing job that you've been doing. Thank you. Um, my question for you would be any advice that you would give to funeral homes that may not have a social media presence or that their social media presence hasn't necessarily caught on, right? The, the people who have kind of passively been, been posting every Memorial Day, every holiday, but not really have, they haven't really generated that sort of um, interest that yours has. Mm -hmm. I would just say, um, take good pictures. Um, the content you create should be something that entertains in a sense uh, that people can connect to and engage with, um, be consistent, be tasteful. Um, just anything that, that is just professional. That's kind of the model we follow. Just be professional, show who we are. We have a lot of great personalities here. Mrs. Williams is a great show. Like when we post for her, uh, just the video, she flips her hair. <laughs> the videos always do just bigger numbers than what anyone else does when they post. So I don't know uh, when it comes to Mrs. Williams, what to say to that, because she just has that light that shines in the way that people can connect with. But what I can do is just focus on creating good content, be professional, be tasteful, make sure everything, you know, is just polished as it should be. Yeah. And get yourself a Mrs. Williams. Yeah. He, he's, yes. the, he's the person, he's consistent all day long posting and, and trying to and get something of, on there. And I'm thinking it's just, I mean, it's never stopping. I just don't have that energy that he gives to. And the reason <laughs> I give that energy is because it was spiritually, I felt something that was told to me before I actually started, not to get too deep, but I just felt like this is a spiritual path I'm walking that God has me on. And yeah. he wants growth. And so that's just what I meditate on and think about and try to really manifest. Yeah. When I, from my experience with social media, really what people say is that consistency is key, right? Just consistent content. If you get, if you don't get any hits, if you're not getting likes, just keep posting, keep, keep, posting. keep putting things up and keep interacting with individuals on social media. I think that that's a great, great advice. Absolutely. Um, well, we're going to open it up to any questions. If anyone has any questions, if there are no questions, that's okay. We'll we'll kind of move on. Um, but any questions from the group, from anyone about social media, their experience with TikTok, that sort of thing? Are you doing daily posts? I do daily uh, recordings, but I don't post daily. I probably try to post three to four times a week. Um, but every day we're doing some type of content so that we can space it out and not inundate people too much. Um, yeah, so not every day, but uh, every day we're working on content. Which is every day. <laughs> I have a quick question. What's the ratio between videos and pictures that you, that you post? On TikTok, I only do video. Um, on Facebook, I... Facebook predominantly likes pictures along with Instagram. And then I might throw in a video or two um, if it's a good video. And, but mo majority on TikTok is just videos. On Facebook and Instagram, you can mix it up and just see what the audience uh, really is digesting. Uh, both of them do well, a uh, video and photos do well on Facebook and Instagram. You don't see an increase in viewership if you do a video compared to pictures or anything like that? Um, yes, for a video, if it's good, you can see a lot of more shares and yeah. a lot more likes and comments. Um, so yeah, if the video is good, it could, but I've also seen a picture do better than a video. Yeah. So it's, I guess it's just based on, on the audience. Yeah, maybe it's the people. Sure. Good question. 
And we have a question from Jason. He says, what permissions do you get from families prior to services, written or verbal, or are all services recorded public? So kind of, are, are you taking videos or are you making content from your families? Um, and if so, are you getting permission from them beforehand or are you just posting? Yes, during the arrangement conference, we have a social media form. Um, and once we finish getting all of the uh, disclaimers and the contract taken care of, then we go over um, what that social media entails. And it pretty much, it has streaming, it has Facebook, it has uh, TikTok, it has everything that we do. And once they sign, they're allowing us to post without having a problem later on. Yeah. So, yeah, we definitely get um, the authors. Prior to. Important there, information. So thanks, Jason, for that question. Go ahead. There are families that don't want it, and so they just don't sign yeah. it, and then we just and we don't post anything. Yeah. They don't want right. you know their loved ones' information on Facebook uh, or the website or the website. So they don't sign it, and we don't post anything. That totally makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, Kathy is asking what social media platforms you're on. Um, if you post on Twitter specifically, we have a Twitter. Um, I don't post there too much i'm still trying to figure out twitter uh, but we have a presence there it's all people's fh1 but i think everyone's still trying to figure out twitter it's a confusing <laughs> social media site for sure and are you on instagram as well we are all you people are. in our own yes ma'am okay perfect well any other questions for saeed and for deborah Okay, well, we're, we'll hear more from them um, once we go to their general questions. For now, we're gonna switch it over to Todd Snyder with Snyder Funeral Homes. Hey, Todd. Hello. Um, so Todd is the, the funeral home of all funeral homes. He has a lot of locations. He has a lot of staff. <laughs> we are really grateful for his um, expertise and his, um, his insights into the business. The first thing that I wanted to ask you specifically, Todd, is about um, live streaming, um, how you've approached live streaming since the start of the pandemic and how you've continued to improve in the area of live streaming. Well, um, yeah, the, of course, virus threw us into that um, full throttle. And initially we weren't prepared for it as was you know, the whole profession. Yeah. So it threw us into the Facebook platform. and. Um, we are a family business of too many rooftops. Um, we have uh, several brands uh, operating 18 locations. So um, my, my daughter, and I believe she's on here, Hannah Wernicke, she is my um, Facebook social media technology guru. She, of course, had already claimed all of those Facebook um, domains all of our google domain uh, you know everything for that so, so she was prepared for that long before we uh, needed them awesome. and uh, we immediately went on uh, facebook for streaming the unfortunate part is with all of those locations tonight we are very judicious in educating people on how to find each of those events and uh, she created um, Facebook events to promote that and help people find them. But we're dealing with an older crowd. So yeah. that old crowd, they either, if they didn't have a Facebook account, they acted like they didn't. And you know, the phone just rang immediately at 11 o'clock every day at the wrong location. And, and it, 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 it has been a problem. Now, unfortunately, we have 18 rooftops. So putting in uh, individual hardwired equipment for a specific company, there are multiple companies that do live streaming and we have not pulled the trigger on any of them. Um, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, we have seen um, basically families aren't asking for it much anymore. Only two of our locations are still doing much streaming. Um, we did not monetize it for the first two years. We just did it for free and our board just recently authorized monetizing it. So we're looking toward putting in a um, platform to do it. Now there are multiple ones. And um, at this point we have not put in dedicated hardware. We're still using Facebook. Got it. 
but we'll have to do a follow-up meeting in a couple of months and see if you've decided on a company to give, give advice to recommend it to us. Actually, we'll bring my daughter in because she will have researched it thoroughly. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. And um, uh, she will come to me with that recommendation. Yeah. She can, she can get be our expert for all of us. Please. Um, it's interesting that you see that live streaming is kind of going away with the pandemic. You're seeing more people coming into the funeral home um, and not really demanding that live streaming anymore. Yeah, correct. We were live streaming probably 98% of all events through 2000 and 2001. Um, this year, we just aren't being asked. Um, I'll bet we're maybe live streaming 5% or less now. And honestly, I've asked the directors to not even prompt families to ask because I want people back in our buildings. Yeah. I want them back in the experience. I want the, um, the, the group response to death and group needs to be in person, not virtual. Yeah, definitely. And I think that for your own business, the funerals that I have attended that I've loved their, their they've had excellent service. I've been more willing to go to that, that funeral home if I've needed it, right? So I think that attending funerals and having a great experience while mourning the loss of a friend or someone who may be a little bit more distance from you may prompt right. you to choose Snyder Funeral Homes in the future, for sure. One of the three reasons people select a funeral home is the location they were in where they had a favorable experience. Definitely, yeah. Mm -hmm. so and I, I do think that funeral homes are unique in the profession in the professional world where it is a community building experience, right? It's less, right. it's not like a normal business where you're going to the dentist, right? You're not going to whatever business place of business you're going to a funeral home to mourn and it is more of a community experience. So having that in person does make a difference. Correct. Yes, we, we want the group experience. We want a purposeful, organized, flexible, time-limited response to death. Yeah, yeah. Um, Hannah is wondering, have people had a different experience with, have you noticed a different experience with live streaming versus in-person meetings? And if families are still requesting live streaming without being prompted. So if the funeral directors aren't saying, hey, I, we would love to have a live, if you would like to do a live streaming, are families are requesting that? Very, that very few families. Yeah, okay. uh, they're not being prompted or, or, or asked anymore. Do you want live streaming? So typically at the arrangement conference, it's not brought up. If a family yeah. is asking for it, it's typically after the arrangement conference and they're like, oh yeah, Aunt Tilly is in Schenectady and she, she can't attend. Can we live stream it? Sure yeah. we can. Of course we will. Um, if, if it's going to be just for one person, we'll often try to accommodate um, you know, a, a FaceTime call because mm -hmm. Aunt Tilly doesn't have a Facebook and she's, you yeah. know, it, it, there are other options for her, but um, for the most part, we are not getting much at all in the, in the form of requests for, for live streaming anymore. That's really interesting. Um, any, any other changes that you've made during the pandemic and are there any changes that you've made since the start of the pandemic that you have decided to continue on, right? So any, any changes that you've made to your staffing, to your protocols, to the operation side, or even to the, the funerals at a large that you will be continued to, that you continue to do after COVID is over? Um, every building, of course, got hand sanitizing stations at every entrance, yeah. right? Uh -huh. Every building has um, disposable surgical masks, face masks available at the entrances now. I don't see that going away anytime soon. Yeah. Uh, occasionally, people will come in and enter and they'll say, oh, do I have to wear a face mask? No, you don't have to. Uh, in Ohio, we aren't in any, um, in any uh, emergency pandemic stage right now. Um, our locations are in central and north central Ohio. And like most regions, you kind of go through cycles where um, the percentage of, of COVID positive tests uh, range up and down. Um, yeah, we've gone through that here. Uh, it's, it's not critical here now. Um, yeah, I'd say uh, we have uh, reduced the number of people that were asking to come to arrangement conferences. It wasn't uncommon to have 12 to 15 people at an arrangements conference. 
And it was really nice to say, you know, two people max for an arrangement conference back then. And, and mm -hmm. we're not telling people you can't have 12 or 15, but we're, we're suggesting that we not do that continuing. Yeah, that's a great change to keep up. It is. Yeah, it is. Um, we, we got really good at doing arrangements virg virtually during virus. Yeah. Quite frankly, we're continuing that. Yeah. Um, I, I can think of maybe two uh, services going on this week right now where most of the arrangements are all being done virtually um, with our version of, of DocuSign, electronic documents, mm -hmm. a lot of emails, a lot of phone calls, and um, the family is just going to breeze in for the service itself. Um, so, you know, we kind of perfected that during virus and, you know, we had to convince ourselves that, that we could do that and that yeah. it was okay. So yeah, it's okay. I, do I like it as much? No, I, I think it's a little harder to establish rapport mm -hmm. in those relationships. Um, but when the son's in North Carolina and he just, you know, gosh, um, it's unfortunate that mom died. I really can't fit it into my week. Um, okay, well, you know, that, that's the best option right now. Yeah. Um, so we fit that into our game plan. Uh, what else is, is continued from virus? Um, hmm. uh, some of our scheduling for staff has changed. Yeah. Um, we've added more staff to give staff some time off. Um, so I would say those are the big ones. Awesome. No, that was, that's a great, great answer. Um, kind of speaking about staff specifically and, and the locations, how are you kind of, we'll shift over, but we've talked about you having multiple locations. You all obviously are a, a huge firm. Um, how are you maintaining your level of um, continued service while increasing your locations and your staff? What are the challenges that you have received and what are the the problems that you see in the future? What are the benefits of, of growing your business? If you just want to talk a little bit about that, that'd be great. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I don't know that we're a huge firm. Um, we're, <laughs> um, we're just a big family and we run funeral homes. That's all we do. Um, we, we have identified in the past the, the uh, challenge of serving a, a large geographic area. When I say large, we're in nine counties in central Ohio. Some of our markets, we have 100% of the market. Some counties, we have 90%, others 60% of the market share. Um, and under that model, we have many families that will use one, one location for a family member and then another location for another family member. So we want to make sure that their experience is the, is the same or as close to the same as possible, regardless of which Snyder location they get. Yeah. Um, yeah, you have to draw the comparison to the Big Mac is the same, regardless of what arches you buy it under. Yeah. So um, to do that, our executive team um, does supervise the staff as closely as possible. And we're, we're trying to get better and better at making sure our client experience is the same regardless of their location now. But their experience is unique because of the, the building they're in. We understand that. And there are some external forces that we can't control, but we can control the relationship and we can yeah. control. And, and that's, that's what's most critical is that that family felt listened to and valued and, uh, and, and uh, dealt with uniquely and given a special service. And that's really one of our hallmarks. So yeah. what we've identified is that it's most important that every uh, division of our operation uh, begins each day with kind of a, um, a, a morning meeting of the staff, dictating who's identified to go where and what. It's not just log into your software and you're ex responsible to do this and this has been assigned to you. It's really a, a team goal to let's make sure we all do this together and very verbal, um, very cohesive, and making sure that the team knows that we are delivering together a product. Yeah. And because we operate in four different teams, then the executive member of that team, we meet on a regular basis. 
to make sure there is consistency across all of our locations. Um, yes, we do many things together. We do buying together. Um, you know, we, we buy products the same. Uh, so a lot of those things are consistent. The most important thing is the delivery of the relationship. And that's, that's what our executive team works on the most. Definitely. Um, any other advice that you would give to um, individuals that are looking to expand their funeral homes um, to buy new brands or to just expand their current brand? It's all relationships. Um, you know, sometimes relationships works and sometimes it don't. It doesn't, I should say. Um, you know, it's a, it's a sword that is edged on both sides. Um, we, we are the brand that many single location owners come to and say, I need to retire by my firm because yeah. they know that we will lovingly treat that firm. It's, it's like his daughter. It's like a child. And he knows that because of our track record in, in running other places, he see what, sees what we do in other communities. He knows that we will treat that child very well. Yeah. Um, because of our size, uh, sometimes we become the big guy in some other people's minds. So yeah. uh, that's, that kind of cuts both ways. So it is all about relationships. Through our decades, we have always um, been available to help anyone as colleagues. Um, anybody else in this business needs to borrow a, a fleet piece from us, a hearse or limousine, always available. We, yeah. have four, we have four crematories. They've always been available to anyone else in our region. Um, you know, whether or not they need cremation services, if their regular crematory is down, you know, um, it's always about building um, um, a bond such that, you know, we're very, just very transparent with people. And um, un unfortunately, there is in every profession some mistrust between competitors. And quite frankly, um, uh, we've tried to never foster that. Yeah. Because, um, there are, there are nine of us in my family, and I'm the old geezer, so I'm not far from being gone. Uh, both of my kids are in the business and owners here, so there will be many, many decades of Snyders behind me. So mm -hmm. we, we've always operated in a manner that will protect the company and continue to grow it because um, growing it is the key to survival. Down yeah, the road. definitely. Now, one of our core values at, at Jomani Care is building and strengthening relationships. And I think that that's just good business. In the end of the day, that does make you a good human being and making sure that you are available, again, to your competitors, to anyone else in the business, to give them advice. Even this is what you're doing right now is, is just building and strengthening relationships. And I think it's not only good for the soul, good for yourself, but I think it's also good for business. It translates into good it, business. It is who we are. Uh, yeah. We are staying people on Monday as we are on Sunday. Yep. Um, and that's one of just, it's just who we are. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's awesome. Well, we do have, we're going to open it up to a couple of questions um, for you, Todd. The first one is from Jason. He says, are you using Damani Care to understand the quality of families experience? Have you used Damani surveys? Uh, we are not unfortunately, yet using their survey program. Uh, I think we are one of the very first companies to use the texting program. Uh, I don't even know if you, you know that, Janessa. I didn't know that, um, no. <laughs> yeah, I think we're maybe firm number one. Ask Riley about that. Um, yeah, you ask, you bring him in that. Um, we are still using um, uh, a different survey form at this point, but um, we're using um, uh, an old style survey for a specific reason, but we're using the Domani uh, text follow-up specifically for the um, aftercare portion and the Google reviews, which was, um, which is, is really key. And quite frankly, I'm looking at that also as a portion is survey. 
Mm -hmm. uh, when I'm looking at Google reviews that come in, and I see a client mentioning their director by name in a Google review, that's huge. Um, yeah. It's great to get a five-star review, okay? It's better when it's a five-star review with comments. Absolutely. Okay? The, I, there's literally, there is a red painted cowbell in my office and the cowbell gets rung hard when there's a Google five-star review and they've named one of the directors. That's okay. fantastic. That tells, yeah, that tells me that that director did his or her job to really connect with that client. And now two, three weeks after their event, they not only took the time after a favorable event, but they remembered Liz's name or they remembered Sean's name. They wanted to really compliment Susan, okay? And, and that's worth something to me. Yeah. Um, Hannah's wondering if you have ever heard them mention the name Elizabeth. <laughs> wing, oh, wing. yeah. I mean, that was from day one, yeah. <laughs> I think, I don't know, but I think my daughter, my daughter's also Hannah. I think Hannah and I picked the name Elizabeth, actually. Yeah, well, I, I love think, that. Yeah, I think so. And um, you'll see Elizabeth's name in some of the Google reviews. And she's on some of our surveys, too, because one of our actual survey questions is, is there a staff member that was uh, uniquely important to your experience with Snyder's? And um Often it's, yeah, everybody on the whole staff or they'll, they'll mention their director or they'll mention their director and Elizabeth. And I just, <laughs> yikes, <laughs> really, yeah. The win for us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because they're getting that survey about the same time, maybe a week after the texting program comes out. Yeah, yeah. that is awesome. Well, any opening it up to any questions from the group, if anyone, you can unmute yourselves and ask it or ask it on the chat and I'd be happy to to answer. Okay. I just had a question to the to everybody. Um, obviously, Todd's experience has been that um, there has been a decline in in the request for live streaming. But I was wondering if that wasn't someone's experience, and they're seeing a higher demand for live streaming. And if if so, I wondered if anyone could speak to that and how they've handled that. unless everyone's had the same experience. I have a question and this is uh, for Todd, but it really could be for, for any of you that are on this. Um, but just as it relates to the, the pandemic, I think forced everybody to get a little bit creative, right? With your systems and processes and, and operations. So, so specifically as it relates to embracing technology at large, uh, whatever that might be, um, and just, different innovative solutions, but still trying to provide a great customer experience for uh, your families. How has maybe your methodology changed um, or the way in which you, you do services as, as it specifically rate, relates to adopting technology uh, to do your business uh, more efficiently? I think Todd, you had mentioned um, staffing can be a, a challenge. So I imagine there are solutions out there that um, are helping you run your business more efficiently, but not at, and, and I imagine knowing you that you're not going to do it if it's going to diminish the customer experience, right? You're, you're going to provide still a world-class experience for those families. But just if you have any thoughts about that specifically, uh, because I think that will be great insight, even moving forward into the future, uh, as, as the profession does change, we don't want to lose the core of what we are uh, all about, and that is providing exceptional service to families specifically. Yeah, it's dif it's difficult to um, get too deep into technology. Um, yeah, I could sit at my desk all day, and actually, some days I, when you know, I, you'll people close to me will hear me say all the time, "This is not the job I signed on for," because I signed on. Um, decades and decades ago to be a funeral director, but now I'm running a funeral business. I would much rather be out 
meeting client families, running funerals. Um, yesterday, we, uh, this actually this morning, we had a service for a, an elderly lady. Her husband um, was kind of upset that I didn't meet with him Saturday. I can't meet with everybody. I get it. Um, but after they were settled for their visitation yesterday, I met with him and he starts crying and hugging my neck and, oh, you're here, Todd. And I'm like, Joe, of course I'm here. That's what I would love to do. Now, technology um, helps me sort out everything um, and allows, my, allows me to have directors to do what I would love to do. And it, it allows um, all of my people, and I've got, um, I've got great people. I've got, I mean, this isn't about me or my family. This is about the team we've collected. We have got just the absolute best team in this, in the state of Ohio. Um, I have confidence in everyone. I'm not ashamed of one of them. So it allows them to be who they need to be with our client families. And the technology just lets me uh, and our executive team let them shine. That's great to hear. I want to pose that question specifically to Lindsay. Um, Lindsay, I know that you obviously are a young funeral director, young owner. Um, how have you, like Jonathan, John's, sorry, I don't, I've never called you Jonathan before. John's question about technology, especially in relating to the response to the pandemic, how have you utilized that technology? Yeah, we've done a couple things. Um, so we had been webcasting for maybe 10 years prior to the pandemic, we kind of started it as an answer to, we had a service member who couldn't come home because they were serving our country. And we thought, you know, they should be able to at least watch their, their grandpa's service at the time. And then we just kept doing it. So we have a YouTube channel where folks can watch their service kind of just in response to Facebook. We looked at Facebook, um, you know, way back then, but for the same reason Todd mentioned, not everyone has Facebook, whereas everyone can log onto the YouTube and and watch watch the services. And we bought our own domains so that way; it's not at a YouTube, but it's at our specific um, web address. And that's been very helpful for us. We've definitely seen a decline, uh, like Todd said, in the amount of requests. Um, and we also don't monetize it; uh, we do it more of as a as a goodwill thing because, like technology. Uh, it can fail. And if we were to charge for it, we would have yeah. to, of course, refund that money. And so we look at it as if it goes perfectly, then great. But if not, you know, technology is technology. A um, couple other things that we've done is we built a virtual selection room. So that way, when we did phone calls or Zoom calls during the pandemic, we could be looking at the same thing the family was looking at. So we could go through the general price list with them online. We could go through the caskets with them online, go through the urns, go through the holy cards, go through literally everything. And that way, it, kind of like what Todd was saying is creating that relationship, even though we're on the phone, um, by being able to see the same thing. And so that, that greatly helped us. Um, another thing that we did was to scan in every single one of our files. So that way I can access them from anywhere. So if a family calls at, you know, nine o'clock at night and, oh, does my mom have a pre-need and what does it say? I'm not having to drive in and figure it out. I can pull it up on my phone and say, yep, she pre-arranged in 1988 and this is what she wanted back then and, and go from there. Uh, that was kind of spurred on the fact that one of our um, colleagues in the industry had a fire and they had lost everything. And we thought, you know, how devastating would that be to lose 40 years worth of pre-needs? Um, that's yeah. just irreplaceable, basically. Um, and all the money is, was, of course, safe in the other companies, but to know, you know, which company it's with and, and that is, is, is something that we definitely had to do and it took about four months. We had a one lady that worked about two days a week, just literally scanning in files and not, not the most glamorous job, but I'm sure glad on those Saturday nights when a family calls, I can just pull it up and boom, there it is. Um, the other thing we've done, uh, I guess, I guess that's, it really is the virtual, virtual website or virtual selection room and scanning in documents and then the webcasting. 
would be the, the biggest technology pieces that we've done. Lindsay and I talked a little bit yesterday about that, the scanning process. I actually worked at a funeral home, it, putting me through college. And that was part of my job was scanning some of the old documents. So I know how tedious of a job that can be, but important, definitely important. Well, yes. we'll transition over to some of your questions that we have specifically for you, Lindsay. Um, just as a little introduction to people, um, for people, the first John, John Cuff funeral home was opened in 1884. Is that right, Lindsay? Correct. Yes. And Lindsay and her sister, Chris, are the sixth generation working at the funeral home. She's actually in the process right now of buying and taking over that family business, which congratulations to you and your sister. That's a Thank great you. Question. Um, what have you learned through this process of buying your family funeral home? And do you have any guidance to others that may be experiencing a similar transition or expecting a similar transition in the future? Great question. Uh, we've definitely taken this process slow because it's not something that is a, you know, just easy thing to do. Um, and we've assembled a great team. Uh, I, I kind of like how you said it, Todd, the, the right seats on the right bus. So we have a trusted accountant. We have a trusted uh, financial planner, a, attorney, and then a funeral um, associate with Greystone that has kind of helped make all the pieces come together. And so we initially set a goal of when we wanted to have it take place. And we're on track right now to... Uh, kind of quote unquote signed papers on June 30th. So it's it's not a done deal yet, but we're we're hoping that everything comes together nicely. So my biggest piece of advice was would be to find those trusted advisors uh, that you know that can be that person for you that can help guide you and to look at your family dynamics. Um, my parents own the business together and they're selling it to myself um, and then my sister. So it's it's now going to two separate households, if you will. Um, so that's been a dynamic that we've had to figure out. And um, also uh, one of our primary goals is the success of the company. And so we have focused a lot on making sure the company succeeds no matter what, whether one of us is um, ill or can't work anymore or whatever, there's safeguards in place so that way the company will succeed, hopefully no matter what. Yeah, that's awesome. When I know your funeral home is obviously an older funeral home, what is it like to operate a funeral home that has existed in the community for such a long time? Are there some practices that you've adopted over that time that, that have changed? Have you seen some differences in the community, that sort of thing? I know obviously that was what, a hundred and forty years ago, almost right. So the big difference is there from one hundred and forty years ago. What has changed? What has stayed, stayed the same in the community and in your funeral home? Well, so much has changed. I mean, it's a totally different industry. Uh, back when my great 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 grandpa started, it was basically a cabinet maker turned casket maker. Um, so yeah. there was no focus on the service. And then even at my grandpa's generation two generations ago, he was also the ambulance in town. Um, and now, of course, we don't do not do that and we don't make our own caskets. And, and so it's changed drastically. Yeah. Um, and now the, the technology piece is, is probably one of the biggest changing things of, of meeting people in today's needs. And um, also one of the biggest things we've done is expand our service offerings. And so we've built an outdoor setting because people in the pandemic especially want to be outdoors. And so we uh, peeled up a bunch of grass and put in a really, really, really nice turf. Uh, so that way it looks nice. And then we have a tent and we made that another chapel, if you will. And people love it. They, one of the curses though, is now they're waiting to do services until it's nice and in the summer months, because we're in Northern Michigan. And so right now we're in this um, service crunch of people who waited from December, January, February, and are now yeah. celebrating their service. So it's, it's been both a blessing because it's helping people to have another cool service venue, but it's also been a curse, um, of that delay because basically you get to re-meet with that family. Um, yeah. cause I don't know about all of you, but four months pass and I will remember their face forever. Cause I'm a face person, but I'll, I'll have to look at my notes to, <laughs> to remember their name and, and to, to remember all the details that we talked about, you know, four months ago. What a great idea though. That's awesome. And an outdoor space is, is, is beautiful. Like that's a great idea. Um, do you, I, I, what unique experiences do you feel like you faced in the funeral industry that may be different from others? 
you and your sister or just you, whatever, whatever. I know that it's being a sixth generation woman taking over her parents' business, it may be just a little different. Yeah, good question. So uh, we never had maternity leave before. Uh, so I was the first one to have children and um, my parents lovingly called it a disability. <laughs> and so we got six weeks, um, dis you know, short-term disability leave. And I, I always joke with them that their grandchildren are <laughs> products of my disability. Um, so <laughs> I, I mean that as respectfully as possible. Um, but that was one thing that, that before that it was all male funeral directors. So maternity leave wasn't, wasn't ever a thought. Um, so that was something that we had to, to, figure out. And then as a consequence, I also uh, try really hard to be a good mom and a good director and a good now owner. And so I am very lucky that I get to take time off to be with my kids. And they're actually calling me right now. Um, but I only work, you know, 35 to 40 hours a week in the building. Um, and then the rest of the time I'm, I'm on the phone or, you know, working for, through emails or that kind of thing. So I, I try really hard to, to multitask whenever I can. Yeah, that's great. Um, we're going to open it up to questions from the group. It looks like Jason has asked, what software slash means did you use to create and share the virtual arrangement slash selection room? Yeah, we partnered with Funeral Kiosk. And then we also bought our own domain name because we didn't, it, they send you a, like this big long link that you have to send to families. And I, I didn't like that. So our, our selection room is called RJFH, stands for Reynolds Drunk Off Funeral Home Selections.com. And so you can go to it at any time. And it has everything basically that we offer on there. I, I would love to revamp it again. It's, it's been now up for three years and I want to tweak it to make it better. Just like all technology, it goes out of date quickly. Um, yeah. But yeah, funeral kiosk. Um, Sean is the gentleman who helped us with that. And he was wonderful to work with and got us going within a week. Um, so it was, it was amazing. That is awesome. And very, very good for timely pandemic issues to come up in a week. That's, all, that's great. Um, any other questions? I'm going to open it up to the, to the gallery. Any other questions we have for Lindsay? Let's look through. Erin, go ahead. Like, yeah, I would, um, not just for Lindsay, but um, for, for everybody, um, I would love to know, Todd mentioned um, the cowbell, which I completely appreciate. And as, as your current account manager, I can attest that I'm sure that bell is rung often, um, rightfully <laughs> so. Um, also, Lindsay kind of mentioned the one chance to get things right. And I know the other account managers have recently heard a lot of uh, the same kind of issues with staffing. Um, what not uh, only from the panelists, but from anybody, what what do you all do to kind of maintain your stamina or, or make sure that you're caring for yourself um, as well as your staff members um, in terms of morale um, and just being able to rise to the occasion, you know, for that one, um, for those important moments kind of continuously? Well, I would love to, to answer that first if I could. Um, we actually hired a therapist for our staff uh, that talks about vicarious trauma. It was a four, four session experience that any of our staff could come to. And we had two dedicated to just funeral directors. And she talked about how, like it or not, we all went through a trauma. And I think everyone did through the pandemic. And we really wanted to highlight that there is help out there. And we saw a tremendous amount of burnout signs and compassion fatigue. And we thought, you know, there's gotta be someone out there that can help us and address this. And one of the biggest things I learned is just simply talking about it and not sweeping it under the rug and putting it out there helped our staff so much. Our, our morale has never been higher and it's, it's helped a tremendous amount. And I just found a local person who, who specialized in, again, it's, it's called vicarious trauma of, you know, we ourselves, you know, thankfully hadn't lost a family member due to the pandemic, but the pandemic itself and helping people who had gone through this, it caused this secondhand trauma, if you will. And talking about it with her and talking about our mental health and talking about our, our needs as humans, because we're not just directors, we are humans as well, was tremendous, tremendous help. And I 
strongly encourage all funeral homes to to reach out or, you know we also have a chaplain on staff that our directors and our whole staff can go to so that way if they want to go uh, the more spiritual route they can do that as well and that has been a huge morale boosting uh, thing and then the other thing that we have been doing and this probably correlates with the high morale but um, we we have four days off and so when you have a day off you we we want to understand if you have to come in for a reason. We, we don't want you to come in. We want you to have that time away and that time with your family and that time to recharge your batteries. And that has been a really big morale booster as well. That is great. Um, anyone else who wants to answer that question is kind of how they've combated burnout um, or their lo the loss of the staff, the, the complications with staff morale, especially after the pandemic? Well, since um, pandemic, we've implemented more staff to provide for more time off for the staff. Um, just, was it last week or week before? Um, if you're familiar with um, professional sports at all, you know our Cleveland Indians had to rename themselves. They're no longer the Indians, they're now the Guardians. So we, um, we have a big summer event. We have rented, um, a big um, shoot they call it the terrace club it's a big blast in pavilion up there so all of our employees along with their plus one their children are all going to go up uh, july 3 we're basically shutting down operations a day we'll outsource um, care calls that's what we call removals for that day and the whole team is going to uh, mlb for the day just to do some uh, team building, some relationship, just basically a day off. Um, we try to schedule that. Uh, we, we do one around Christmas time too, but this summer event is just designed to, you know, um, we, we facilitate a lot of, of um, oh, informal things too. I try to personally, I try to uh, zone in on everybody on, that's on my direct work team what's going on? Are you okay? Um, generally take out uh, the guys to lunch on a regular basis. Um, yeah. Just a personal thing. I don't take ladies out for lunch um, by ourselves. That's just a um, personal thing of mine. Um, but just making, keeping a finger on the pulse of the employees. And you know what, if somebody needs an afternoon off, get out of here. Yeah. The, this, this is very emotional work that we do sometimes. And it's, it's important that I don't assign, um, you know, a, an infant loss or a fetal death to the, to the guy that just had a baby four months ago. Yeah. Uh, being sensitive to those kinds of, of familial things going on. It's just being, being sharp about that too. Yeah, no, that's great. And kind of going along with your comments earlier, focusing on us getting through this together as a team instead of individuals getting through their individual cases, right? It's more right. of a team effort. That's, that's incredible. Well, we're going to have a couple more questions for the panelists, um, but let's, let's open it up to any questions that the team, that anyone has or anyone for the, for the panelists specifically. And then we'll end with a couple of questions that I have specifically for the panelists. So any other questions that has been burning in people's minds or, or people have had thoughts about, it looks like H Hector is ordering a cowbell from Amazon. So that's a, that's a plus. I hope to see a lot more cowbells next time I see you guys. Um, any other questions that we have for the panelists specifically? A uh, quick question. What is um, the most effective way that you found to stay connected and, and be supportive to other professionals in the funeral industry? Like, is it, is it difficult to connect with other people in the industry? I'm um, Saeed, if you want to, if you have anything to add to that. It kind of broke up when she was speaking. So I just wanted to please repeat what, you, yeah, what so the question was. Her question is, is specifically, um, how do you connect with other people in the funeral industry? Is that right, Kayla? Yes. <laughs> How do we connect? Um, I think just by our personality, for one, and what we offer, um, 
people are not afraid to come in and just open up and we're not afraid to be transparent. Um, we're, we have Christian counselors on staff so people can come in and speak to the counselors that helps build a rapport with the community. Um, for the staff members, we do birthdays, um, big birthday celebrations so that, you know, that builds morale, rent out movie theaters, um, and we're in the community a lot, connecting with churches and uh, different families and seminars. We go to the um, uh, adult care homes, um, and we have had so many families that we served from those facilities just by being present, playing bingo, singing songs to them. Um, we have a choir. It's just so much that uh, Mrs. Williams has put in place to make sure that we are just covering all bases. Yeah, no, that that is great. Lindsay or Todd? Go ahead, Lindsay. Yes. Oh, sorry, sorry, uh, so, Mrs. Williams. I, I, I think to... I'm so sorry. Go Ms. ahead. Williams, I want to finish that. Sorry. I was just saying sometimes the morale around here is a little bit too high. It's they have probably too much fun sometimes. I love it. You know, we something going on. <laughs> I love it. Lindsay, sorry, go ahead. No, no worries. Uh, just to connect with other funerals, funeral homes in the industry, um, three big things. Uh, one, I follow other funeral homes on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok because I want to learn from, from what they're doing. And so, Saeed, I am going to become a follower. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the second one is belonging to uh, professional organizations. So we're members of Selected Independent Funeral Homes, uh, which for us, the biggest one is that um, the group chat or group discussion forum, if you will, that they have. It's an email chain that anyone at any time can post a question. And I can't tell you how many times answers have come up within seconds uh, to their questions or requests that, yeah. you know, it, it takes a village to serve. And so I, I really believe in that. And then uh, I mentioned we also belong to Greystone Associates. Uh, we have a um, group that we meet with about eight funeral homes in Michigan. So that way we're all on the same page. We call it a, like a Michigan summit. And then we also have an annual summit where we get together with about 80 funeral homes uh, once a year, just to connect and talk about ideas and talk about how to grow and be better and serve better. Um, so those, those are the two big ones. And then also belonging lastly to our state association and going to those annual conventions and as tired as those are, and I think they can use a little revamp, um, there is still a benefit to going to those and, and to meeting those, but it would be nice if someone gave them a little sparkle. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I like that. Well, we, um, we hope that this is kind of a good community as well to connect with other people in the funeral industry and kind of facilitate these discussions, get answers to your questions and get some insights to people who are having similar similar experiences, but also different unique experiences that they can bring to, to the table. Um, the final question I have, well, I have two questions actually left for the panelists. The first questions are going to be, um, in your opinion, what are the most critical changes that the funeral industry must make to face the future effectively? So if you could name one or two things that are, are the best things to prepare for the future, I know that this discussion has been very future forward looking um, so one or two things that, that people can make a difference in um, facing the future effectively. What's the most important things? Said, if you want to start, and Deborah. One thing, one thing that we did was put a digital database in place so that we can um, have a snapshot of each case across from each location. Each staff member can go in and notate anything that they handle on any case. We have a system in that system that uh, does scheduling. So it's more, it's more of a, a digital platform that we're operating from. And someone mentioned about how there was a fire that destroyed all of the uh, files. So because we have been putting that digital uh, database in place since about 2017, um, that has just taken us to another level, being able to uh, serve families, each family, um, in the way that's necessary for them, but still with excellence. Um, there's no drop balls in regards to um, information, in regards to specific details or requests that the families have made. We log it all in and it has benefited us. 
to be able to give each family what they are asking for. Um, as of course it varies family by family, but we meet all the needs because of that digital database. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome. Lindsay? Oh yeah. I hope for the future that the big price difference between cremation and burial grows closer uh, because I want every family treated the same no matter what their choice of disposition is. And so we're working to close that gap at our funeral home and I hope other funeral homes follow suit um, because ultimately it's our service and our care and relationship that we build that, that they should be paying for, not other things like that. So I'm hoping that as an industry, we, we close that gap and it becomes less about the choice of disposition and more about caring and celebrating the life and helping the family at this time. Yeah, that's great. Todd, go ahead. Uh, the number one um, um, important thing to going forward is very easy. It's value. It's not cost and it's not price. It's delivering value so that regardless of whether they choose earth burial or cremation or aquamation or I don't care what they pick, as long as they come back to the funeral hall. Right. They don't, they don't pick a provider off the internet or um, Genesis or, or whatever. Yeah. As long as they don't leave my building going, this was not a good experience. I don't want this for me. Or they turn, or he turns to his wife and says, "Don't do this for me." Right. I want every family to to think they had a great value, a good experience for whatever dollar amount they spent, mm -hmm. so that it's concreted in their mind to come back. Because customer loyalty is not what it was 10, mm -hmm. 20 years ago, and that you know loyalty is great for my loyal customers. It's not good for the customers that that really aren't as loyal to me anymore. Yeah. So uh, the consumer will, will search the internet to find a place that they think they will get good, good value. And I'm gonna compliment Lindsay. I think she inferred or, or right out said that she's put prices online. We have too, the consumer is looking for prices online. Mm. So and funeral homes have been resistant to that. And uh, I think it's important to do that. They'll pay the price. They just want to know what it is. Mm -hmm. They're willing to do that. Definitely. So well, that's it. Value word, it's over everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that, I think that's a great way to end. I, I think that we've had a great time. Thank you panelists for a lively and informative discussion. I know I've learned a lot from each of your individual experiences. Um, thank you for our, to our clients for joining today. I hope that this has been a useful tool for you guys to kind of have a discussion, meet new people, meet new people in the funeral industry, but also learn from different people in the funeral industry. We hope to be doing this on a regular basis. So watch out for our next invitation. Um, any other, oh, it's Jim says, California requires prices to be posted on the front page of the website. So yeah, going along your, your, your comment, Todd. But thank you guys, everyone, for joining. We, we really appreciate it. I think we had a great discussion. Um, thank you, especially to the panelists again. Uh, Lindsay, Saeed, Deborah, Todd, we, we really appreciate you guys and your insights. Okay. Well, yes, thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a great Bye. rest. Of